just find a suitable place before we get started. Good morning, preacher bear. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, yeah, live forest skills, and uh, my turn again this morning. I'm out in the woods again, so I don't have um, I don't have uh, an assistant. So I'm going to be trying to do a little bit of bushcraft and walk around at the same time as uh, hold the phone and prop the phone up. Usual story, but anyway, we'll get by. Hi from Tom and Colette. Um, we'll do a, a usual. I'll just do a few. Hello, morning, Stephen from Amit. Samuel Marshall, hi, how are you, how are you doing guys? Welcome. Uh, we didn't really do much in the way of um, posting. Uh, good morning, all, Oliver, how are you doing? Um, yeah, we didn't do much in the way of posting, so I wasn't sure if anybody would show up this morning. So I'm absolutely delighted that you guys have joined me because um, I've made the effort to come out to the woods and it's a nice day. It's cold um, here in the, the Cheshire countryside. For the youth, hi Stephen, hi guys, how are you doing? Darth, Darth. Kevin, probably that is maybe. Hey, how are you doing? Um, morning from Sarah and Edith. Nice to see you again, guys. Yeah, so we'll do the usual couple of minutes. Um, hi, Stephen from the GH boys. How are you doing? Morning, Snappy Twigs, Forest School. Forest School. That's what you want to be doing, Forest School. Hey, Stephen, how's life? Ah, life's good. Yeah, it's not too bad. Like everybody else, this lockdown uh, goes on and on, but you know we manage life and family and getting out as much nature as we can good morning from peak district national park wow wow i'm honored i'm starstruck i'm starstruck hi how are you doing sorry that message i've not got my settings set very well on these messages they're going a little bit too quickly but from jez Knowles. hi stephen how are you doing and uh, yeah so again a couple of minutes we'll give people another couple of minutes to join in morning from celine and norton how are you doing guys? Um, and then what we're going to do is, I'm out in the woods and it's a bit ad hoc this morning. I'm just going to look at a few uses of plants and trees. We've had quite a few requests for people to show us, uh, for, for, for us to show you about cordage. So it's a very difficult time of year to be doing um, video and video and sound is good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Are you having issues? I can't see the live. Somebody's saying. Mm, no. Can everybody, could somebody write, because I'm in the woods on my own, if somebody could write me a message to say that they can hear and see me perfectly well, that would really be helpful, because I'm, I think I can see you. Right, great. Okay, good. We're, we're, we're fine. <laughs> Morning from Ben. Morning, how are you doing? Uh, I, I can hear and see. Good, all good here. It's fine. Perfect, perfect, right? That's great. I mean, I'm standing out in the woods on my phone, talking to a phone, um, and you just don't quite know whether you're actually live or not. But anyway, yeah, it seems like everybody's fine. Okay, great, perfect, perfect. Kev Keen, yes, mate, brilliant. Bushcraft tool videos. Uh, yeah, well, we'll try. We'll get, we'll get through as much as we can. So, yeah, quite a few requests for cordage and things like that. Again, not a very easy time of year to be trying to show you uh, um, how to make natural cordage. But, morning from Kay or Kai? Kay or Kai? Good morning, how are you doing? Um, so, but I have got a couple of examples I'm going to show you. So, if you're, if you're one of those people that asked that question, then don't worry, I'll get to it. All good, M. Martin, that's great. So yeah, I mean, might as well get started. So I'll do the usual. It's very difficult for me to kind of um, talk about things and walk through the woods while looking at the messages and seeing the messages uh, and reading them out at the same time. So I'll do, I'll do my piece and then at the end we'll do a few questions and a few shout outs. I'll try and keep my eye on the screen. So if you do have any specific questions about anything I'm showing you, please feel free to, to ask them. Uh, and I'm out in the woods and uh, if, anybody's got, if anybody's got any uh, questions about burning questions that aren't to do with what I'm doing here please feel free to ask them because I'm bushcraft mad and I'll do my best to answer them. Morning Stephen Kim. I did see a question there about could somebody do a video showing us how to cut or harvest trees without harming them and that's a really good question and uh, it's really important that you do that correctly so please if you if you can get onto Instagram if you go onto Instagram you go onto online bushcraft onto our posts I did a five minute long video just on that I just wanted to show people exactly how to actually harvest a piece of wood safely, sustainably and uh, without without harming the tree. So please check out that. I spent the time doing it and there's five minutes of stuff. And if you still have questions after that, then um, please feel free to ask them. So basically, I'm, I'm out in the woods and uh, this is not a particularly diverse... If you see any edible mushrooms, please show. Right, I'll show you one. I'm looking at one right now, so I'm gonna take you first stop. I'm gonna take you right there. 
But um, this isn't a particularly diverse woodland, but I just wanted to say that, you know, bushcraft is about engaging with the natural world and it's about the natural world that is local to you. It's not about always trying to find, you know, fancy plants and trees or traveling to far flung places. It's about getting to know your place. So as I stand here in this piece of woodland, I can see maybe five or six species of trees, which are very common, and maybe a couple of slightly less common ones, but there's still plenty to go out there. There's lots of uses, there's lots of things to learn, and it's winter and it's a difficult time. And as I stand here, actually, I can also hear, if you hear, if you can hear that, three little cheeps in a row, followed by a little almost laughing-like sound. And that's a blue tit um, bird, which is alarming above my head, probably because I'm talking into this phone really loudly. So again, there's something else we can do in the wintertime. We can get out and we can learn the language of the birds and we can learn that that's an alarm call. And again, it, bushcraft's just perfect for actually reconnecting with the natural world. So I just wanted to say that. I mean, that's basically what bushcraft's all about. But anyway, first question of the day was, can I see any edible mushrooms? So what I'm gonna do is spin my camera around and I'm gonna show you one. Now this tree here is an elder tree. Okay, now it's gonna be very difficult for you to probably see this, but elder trees grow in a very characteristic fashion. They grow with kind of a large straight trunk. Well, not straight actually, it tends to not be too straight. But uh, what you'll see are lots of side shoots and lots of small branches coming off. And if I zoom in on these, you'll see that we have little leaves at this time of year, they're just unfurling. Um, if I tap on the screen, you might be able to see that a bit more easy. Well, there you go. I'm not sure how easy that is to see, but that's a little purpley-like elder leaf that's unfurling. And uh, the stems are quite straight. And if I was to cut into these, you'd see that they had a pith inside. And these are really useful for all kinds of things. This tree um, is one of the best things. If you watched Ed's fire lighting demonstration on the hand drill, he used an elder stem. And this, this stem here, for example, would be a perfect stem and this is green, this is alive, so you would want to dry that out before using it. But that's one of the great uses of elder. But one of the things that happens to elder trees is they get absolutely festooned with this mushroom here. And I'm going to zoom in on it, uh, come in a little bit closer. And this here has a few names. It used to be called, it used to have a different name, which I'm not going to repeat because it's kind of on PC and we don't call it that anymore. Um, but what, we, what it's called now is um, wood ear, ear fungus, uh, jelly ear, any of those kinds of names, and you can see why it's called that, because it looks like an ear. Now, these are actually frozen. If I was to take one of these off, I can probably scrunch the ice off the top of it. The mushroom itself isn't frozen, but if I scrape the ice off, you'll see it becomes very jelly-like, and it looks just like an ear. And uh, I will say, um, with fungi, I'm going to spin my camera back around, with, with fungi, it's really important that you ID everything perfectly. So don't just take my word for it. If you're going to start picking fungi to eat them, make sure you get a really good book or go on a really good course. But this one is a good one to learn and to look for for your first fungi because it's so common and it's so easy to identify. It's not always growing on elder, but almost exclusively in the UK, you'll find it on elder trees, very common. And uh, it's just like a jelly-like ear. And it's very common, I was in uh, China last year and uh, they eat this by the truckload. They cultivate it in huge numbers and they eat it all the time. And we don't really eat it so much in the UK, um, but I eat it quite a bit. We collect it and take it home. And it's uh, exactly, Preacher Bear's putting up the uh, mycological name for the mushroom for you there. Um, so that's helpful. If anybody saw Preacher Bear's uh, comment there, that's the, that's the mycological name for this mushroom. And um, yeah, so what you can do with this is, I have fried it. You can just fry it in a pan of oil, but it, it's explosive, it's got a lot of water in it, so it jumps around the pan and it can be a little bit dangerous. So what I actually do with this is just chop it up and put it in soups and stews. And it's got an odd texture. It's got pretty decent flavor, but it's kind of crunchy, but soft at the same time. It's hard to explain, but that's exactly how it tastes. And it's probably very good for you because lots of mushrooms have lots of really good nutrients and things in them. And it's very, very common. So there to answer your first question, that is, um, that's the wood ear, the jelly ear, the ear fungus that's common on elder trees. Okay, so I might as well do another mushroom. You can soak it in whiskey and coat it in chocolate. That's a really good idea um, to do. That's another way to make it tasty. Another trick, um, one of my friends and absolute heroes is a guy called Fergus Drennan, Fergus the Forager. Check him out. He's um, amazing wealth of knowledge and experience on wild foods. 
He has a recipe where he, you can actually separate that fungi into layers. If you roll it between your fingers, you can open it and he pipes fillings into the middle of them and uh, he sort of stuffs them. And it uh, takes a little bit of time, but that's really worth doing as well. So check out Fergus Drennan. He's one of the guys you want to be following in the wild food scene. Here's another mushroom. I'm going to spin the, the tree round. Here's a different one, not an edible one. This is a dead birch tree. And uh, identifying birch trees in the UK, pretty straightforward. The bark peels across the tree. Now this one is dead, so it's probably not going to play much use for me. But if you could see, it wants to peel round the way. All the lines are suggesting that. And if I peeled it, it would travel this way. Now the only other tree really in the UK you would find that does that is cherry. But the bark isn't silvery. The bark is a reddy brown colour. So if you've got a silvery white bark and it peels across the tree, you know you've got a birch tree. And again, this is a dead example. But on this tree, we've got these little mushrooms here, these little fungi. This one's actually been, um, has started to decay. But this is a mushroom called, I can probably take this small one off, spin you around again. And this is a mushroom um, for Preacher Bear, if he likes his mycological names. This one's called Fomes formentarius. And this is the horse's hoof fungus. Um, and this is really useful because this is used in fire lighting. Underneath that hard nail on the outside is a thin leather, leathery layer. Uh, and that layer um, you, can, you can use to strike sparks onto. Um, it's really uh, a neat little fungi. There's a, famously there was a, a guy found in the Austrian Alps who was many thousands of years old, a guy, the, the scientist named Utzi the Iceman. And when they found him, they found his remains and he was carrying quite a lot of things which gave us a window into what um, Stone Age people were traveling and using and he had this fungi on him um, so we know it's been used for thousands of years in fire lighting and this is an amazing little mushroom and uh, I've done a few videos on our Instagram and things talking about this mushroom uh, and what you can do with it and how you process it into what we call amadou which is the substance you make um, to use it with fire so that's a really nice little find over here there's actually a better one I'll show you because that one was quite small but I am in the woods and I am kind of just making this up as I go along so there's a better example of, of uh, the horses hoof fungi that's a really nice find so since we're with birch trees we might as well talk a little bit more about birch trees because again in winter time it can be quite difficult to ID trees particularly if you're just learning and uh, but birch trees are really um, easy to identify again for these reasons. I'll spin you back round again and you'll see here's a live birch tree, a much bigger one. And uh, the bark naturally peels and sheds as the gr tree grows. So I can actually strip off some of these fine shavings um, and I won't harm the tree. You would never take off the bark deep enough till you see green. If you see green, you've gone too deep. We never take a knife to a live tree. We just, uh, we just peel what the tree naturally gives. And these little shavings here, most of you will probably know, are fantastic um, in fire lighting. Um, last week you talked about first aid kit when you were using a knife, where to buy it. Let's come to that at the end. Uh, I'll, I'll remind me if I haven't answered that question. Here's the birch, no, birch bark. Now I could strike sparks onto this um, and I'd be able to ignite it because this bark is full of oil. And uh, even when it's wet, you can still strike a spark onto this and uh, it's really useful. But uh, there's another way you'll find birch trees. If I come over to this area, sometimes you'll see a birch tree. Let's find a better one. Sometimes you'll see a birch tree uh, that's fallen over and it's dying, but the bark, because it's full of oils, it lasts for a long time on the ground and the wood will rot. And uh, here's an example of it here. I'll spin you around and show you. And here what we have is a tree which is dead, but it's fallen. And um, this bark I can still use for fire lighting, but what I can't do is peel anything off it because it's been dead so long that lots of the fine shavings have disappeared and the bark is too hard and I wouldn't be able to strike sparks onto it. But what I could do is I could take my knife and I could scrape up some fine, oh, I'm trying to scrape at the same time as show you this. I could scrape some of these shavings oh, oh, up like so. Now I wonder if I can do this. I wonder if I can prop you under my chin. Mm, maybe not. Maybe I won't be able to do that. What I was hoping to do was prop you under my chin and strike a spark onto that, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do that very easily. But anyway, you could, tr <laughs> you could trust me that I could strike sparks onto those tiny little shavings there, and that would also go. So that's another way we can use birch um, to light a fire. If I had a per 
Next time I do this, I'll have an assistant and I'll try and um, I'll try and stick sparks onto it for you live. But then you can take my word for it; that would work. And uh, the birch tree. Well, actually, while we're on the birch tree, there's another useful mushroom. I'll spin you around again. That grows on dead birch, uh, certainly dead and decaying birch. Here's another mushroom. I often get asked, is this the f is this the horse's hoof fungus mushroom, the one I showed you? Um, because it's also very common. And uh, it isn't. This one's different. This one is called the birch polypore, or the razor strop fungus. And it's different. It's not hard. I can depress the top of it. Um, it's quite soft and spongy. Pretty tough, but spongy. And it's brown on top, and it's white on the underside. And that mushroom there... Um, can be used for quite a few things. It's called the razor strop fungi because when you sharpen a knife you often do this thing called stropping at the end and what it does is it removes very fine shavings of metal created by the sharpening process and the stropping takes those little uh, particles of steel off and it makes the knife sharper. And the uh, razor uh, strop fungi or birch polypore uh, was used for that purpose and I've used it myself lots of times for stropping. You can also use it as a medicinal mushroom to treat stomach complaints, which is a classic old use for it. But again, if you're going to self-medicate with mushrooms, definitely uh, get some proper training. Uh, and that's birch tree. There's lots of other uses for the birch. We'll move on from the birch, but lots of other uses such as um, we've got the bark. The wood is great for carving. Yesterday I was actually carving a piece of birch into a handle for a, for a knife I'm making. Um, the leaves you can eat when they're very young, although they taste not great. They taste a little bit soapy, uh, and that kind of alludes to a different use, um, and which is that um, the leaves have this saponin in them. So actually, the leaves of birch trees, when they come out in uh, a month or two, <clears throat> you'll, uh, you can make a soap from them by crushing them up and squeezing out a juice, and that saponin is a natural soap. And so that's another use. I've just spotted something. Um, again, it's, it's February, so not a great time for edible plants, but this down here, you can find growing pretty much all year if you really, really look hard. This is a stinging nettle, um, little nettle there. And that's an incredibly useful uh, plant. We can use it to make cordage. Once it grows much, much higher, we'll be able to use it um, for cordage. The, the outer fibers of the stem are incredibly strong, but also this is a great edible food. Now I'm quite used to picking nettles, so I'm gonna pick one up. And uh, that there, again, not a classic time of year to be collecting uh, edible foods, but there are some things you can find. And this is very young growth, and the small tops here you could use uh, in soups. You can make nettle soup. Now, when you cook nettles, the stings disappear very quickly, so you don't have to worry about getting stung. But that there is incredibly nutritious, full of all kinds of nutrients, and we could use that in soups. I've made beer with this in the past. Nettle beer is quite nice, and um, you can put it in. We often. Uh, make sagaloo in our house, you know, like a potato and spinach curry and uh, we put these in instead of spinach because they're so plentiful and they're much, much, they're even more nutritious than um, than uh, spinach. So that's nettles. Um, somebody put a question up there that I, I just wanted to read. If you, if, if you uh, just asked a question, please ask it again because I'm trying to keep one eye on the screen and also one eye on the woods. Um, somebody asked, are all mushrooms on birch trees safe? Well, um, you don't, the, the three mushrooms really that grow on birch which are common are the horse's hoof fungi, the um, birch polypore, which both of which we've seen, and then another mushroom called chaga, which you do make into a tea um, and, uh, and drink. They're not all, they're not edible mushrooms as such, but they're all certainly uh, safe to touch, collect and use for the specific uses that they're usually for. Um, when it comes to gathering mushrooms and things, we don't really have any blanket rules. We don't, we don't apply all mushrooms this colour uh, are safe, all mushrooms with uh, these colour spots are safe, all mushrooms that squirrels eat are safe. We don't apply any of those rules because most of them aren't helpful and actually quite dangerous. So you have to learn each mushroom um, independently. You have to learn them all properly and that's part of the joy of bushcraft. Um, here's another tree which is really interesting and useful. I'll spin round. This here is a hawthorn tree. Now, I'll take that off because we don't want to get confused. That, those are the, the keys from an ash tree from last year. But this tree here is also useful. And here's some of the old berries from last year. Little red berries. They're still clinging on um, to the tree there. And I wouldn't probably eat these now. They're the last ones that are clinging on. They're very hard and not very nice. But when those are very fresh in the autumn time, you can eat those 
Um, you can make them into fruit leathers and things, that's really useful. And hawthorns also have um, spines on them and then uh, you can use them to make um, fishing hooks is another classic thing we'll do with hawthorn spines. The wood itself um, burns very well if it's great, great as a firewood, but very hard when you're carving with it, but a very beautiful grain because it's white coloured and sometimes you get these purple streaks um, running through it, so that's another thing. Now, you could start firing me some questions because I'm getting to my uh, allotted time. Oh, I wanted to show you um, another tree. Again, difficult to um, difficult to identify trees in wintertime. People often say, how do you identify a tree? Now, the best thing to think of really is, and the best thing to get to know are the bark and the buds. Those are the two things, the two Bs. And I want to give you a good example of a really easy bud to learn so that you can walk into the woods and go, there's no leaves on that tree, that's definitely an ash. And there we are, is a great example of a bud that's easy to learn. It's a black bud, completely black on the end of that stem. Not sure how good a view you're getting of that, but that is a black bud on the end of a stem. And the stem is quite greeny in color and nothing else really looks like that. That's classic. And that's a small sapling, but here's a really large ash tree. And uh, ash is a wonderful wood. Use, all, use it for all kinds of things. I make bows from it because it's very flexible, elastic, but also very strong. It's good for things like axe handles and tool handles. If my axe handle ever breaks, that's what I do. I make a new handle from ash. Um, and there's just a number of really good uses um, for ash trees. So that's another excellent tree that you can identify really, really easily from the buds. And what else can I show you in the woods? Uh, does anybody have any questions for what we've seen so far or any questions that I've missed? I've probably missed quite a few questions. Oh, I know what I wanted to show you. <laughs> I, I'm digressing because I get so excited about trees um, and all the uses. And I've walked about 15 metres and I've seen lots of things that we can talk about and use. But cordage, that's what somebody asked me about. Now, let me show you two kinds of cordage. At this time of year, are King Alfred's Kate's the same as horse's hoof? I'll answer that question now while I remember. No, they aren't. Um, horse's hoof is the mushroom I showed you growing on dead birch trees. Um, King Alfred's Cakes is another name for cramp ball, and the mycological name for that one is Daldinia concentrica. And the concentrica part is really useful to learn because the concentrica means concentric. And King Alfred's Cakes are small black mushrooms and they grow mostly on dead ash trees in the UK. Not always, but mostly and you break them off and if you look inside them you'll see that there are lots of little concentric silvery black and black lines and that's how you know you've got a King Alfred's cake and that is excellent in fire lighting or for cooking over you can actually use that just like charcoal so those are different mushrooms one's on ash and one's on birch so there's really good fungi to get to know that are quite common um, if you're just starting out with mushrooms so um, I've got two types of cordage we keep getting asked about cordage so I decided I would try and do my best so here we have a willow stem. Now I've trimmed this willow stem and what I've done is taken the back of my knife, I've left some of the bark on because you can see, as you can see, and I've scraped off that outer bark. Now we always do that when we make cordage, we scrape off the first surface of bark because when that dries it's very brittle and doesn't make very flexible cords. So that's why we scrape it off. So I scrape that off and I'm still left with the inner bark. Now what I then do is I use a knife to remove that inner bark. Now, I don't only have two hands, can't hold one and show you, so I've prepared a little bit in advance to show you. And basically, what you end up with are these strips of, of fibres. And that there you can use as a very strong binding. Now, in wintertime, uh, just now, what happens with trees is, in wintertime, they go to sleep. They become quite dormant. And a lot of the moisture and the saps and all the stuff that flows up and down through the trees in the springtime, in the summer, in the autumn, it disappears so the bark clamps onto the tree so it's quite difficult to remove which is why when we get asked for cordage at this time of year people keep saying I, I keep kind of avoiding it and say it's very difficult to um, collect cordage uh, barks at least at this time of year but anyway I managed to get some off just to show you that it is possible but it's much harder and I can now use that as a crude binding or I can twist that up into cordage and uh, I'm going to do a separate video on that at some point because I need two hands to show you properly and uh, that there is, is how we do it. Somebody's just asking which tree can you show the tree? Yep, I can definitely do that. 
So that's just a little taster on bark cordage. Um, and I'll show you another type in a minute, but I just want to answer that person's question about which tree. I'll spin the phone round. Now, look how wet this area is. It's very wet. And willows love wet areas. And here is a very typical willow tree. You can see where a branch, a tree has actually fallen over and it's sent lots and lots of shoots up into the sky. And if I zoom in, you'll see they're nice and straight and they grow towards the sky. And willow is a very quick growing wood. It's a very fast growing wood and it's great for all kinds of projects. And here we have the stem of the willow and that's where I removed the bark from. And uh, I'll show you one really thing I often look for when trying to identify a willow tree. Here's a slightly more mature version and you'll see there are these what we call uh, lenticels in the bark, these holes, and uh, they're little they're little diamonds. So when you see these little diamond shaped lenticels, and these are nice big ones for me to show you, then you're in good shape, you know you probably have a willow. And here's another example of how it grows with lots of tall straight shoots and they're all going to be perfect eventually for making cordage. So that's the willow tree. So, like I said, difficult to get the bark off at this time of year, but it is possible. I did manage it. Now, the other type of cordage I wanted to show you, um, something that I made, is this stuff. And this here, believe it or not, is actually bramble. So this is blackberry. So if there are any gardeners out there, anybody who spends a bit of time in the woods or out in overgrown gardens, you'll probably be very familiar with this. This is just your straight up blackberry bramble. And I found this trailing through the woods. It grows very long. And when it's young like this, it grows very thin and it's quite flexible. It's not as flexible at this time of year as it might be in the springtime. Um, and you can use the outer fibers of this, but you can also just use it as it is. Now it's very spiky. So the trick I wanted to show you is how I actually turned this into not spiky, useful cord. Because I could use this to tie up a shelter. I could even use this uh, maybe at a push even to, as an improvised cord for the bow drill. Um, and this, this here is just a really natural, easy to, to make binding. And the trick is either to get yourself a really good glove and run the bramble through your glove to remove all the spines. But I don't have any gloves with me today. So what I made is this, and this is called a break. It's very, very simple. And uh, all I did was I made a little chamfer on the top and then I split this piece of wood for a few inches down the length. And what I did is I then, can't show you again because I've got not enough hands, but I put the bramble, while it was still attached to the ground, I put it inside that hole and I kind of pinched it together. I pinched the the split together and then I just ran it along the cord, ran it along the bramble many times and that broke off all the spines and it took me about 30 seconds to gather, to use that tool which again is called a break and uh, it took me 20 seconds to gather about four or five meters of cordage so I could make, in this woodland here I could make meters and meters of cordage really quite quickly and easy and there is the answer to your question about how to make some kinds of natural cordage at this time of year. So I've uh, I had quite a few other little things I wanted to show you, but I've kind of run out of time and I tried to keep it to 30 minutes. So um, if anybody had any questions, anything I've missed, any comments I've missed um, while I've been rabbiting on, walking through the woods, if anybody wanted to ask me any questions now. Super useful method not to get scratched. Exactly. So if you've got a glove, great, but if you don't, that works really. Willow is also good for medicine, isn't it? Yes, it is. So the bark of willow contains a chemical called salicin, well, salicytic acid it's called. And it's kind of the similar or same chemical as aspirin. So it's a pain reliever. So you can chew a little bit of the bark, a little section about a couple of inches long. You can chew a bit of that and you'll get natural pain, pain relief. And that's one of the other uses of willow. And a few quick, is willow good for carving? A friend gave me a green branch. Well, it is, you can use it to carve with. Yeah, if that's all you can get, then definitely. I mean, it's not the best wood. It's quite fibrous and quite rippy, um, I would describe it as in carving. And, uh, but, it, but, it's, but it's perfectly good. You'll be able to make nice safe spoons and carving utensils. It's also easy to get your hands on. Somebody's just asked me, um, 
I've just my mind's just gone blank. What's my favourite thing to do while I'm out in the woods? Well, tracking. Uh, I've rambled on about trees quite a lot on this little session, but uh, my favourite thing to do on a walk like this is get out in the woods and look for the tracks and signs of animals, and if possible, actually follow an animal for as long as I can. That's definitely my favourite thing. Um, can you recommend a simple knife to use in the woods, not for carving? Um, yeah, again, check out a little Instagram video if you can about... Um, I, I told you, I, I did a little video on how to s select a bushcraft knife that's useful for, particularly for children. And uh, I would say that um, that's really the best safe knife for all use outside, whether you're carving or just collecting the odd fibre or um, whatever you're going to do. That's definitely the safe. I tend to avoid folding knives um, just because that locking mechanism can be a little bit untrustworthy. But Question from Samuel Marshall. What's your favourite? Well, if you can... Samuel, if you can ask me what my favourite something is, I'll definitely try and answer that for you. Lewis says, have you camped out in the woods you're in now? No, I haven't. Uh, time and life and small children. And my kids are just a little bit too young for camping. I have a one-year-old, so we have camped with our first... Um, he's now four, but we camped with our first child when he was seven months for three weeks. So we have done it, but um, at the moment with two children, we don't find it that easier to get out. But no, I haven't camped in these woods, but I would like to. What's your favourite tree from Samuel? Perfect. My favourite tree... Um, my favourite tree is probably... I probably would say ash trees. And again, I'll spin around and show you this beautiful, big, mature ash tree. Um, because uh, ash trees are just... They're just, they're just fantastic trees. They're so useful. I use the wood of ash trees more than I use the wood of any other tree for all kinds of projects, all kinds of really useful things from canoe paddles to bows to carving projects, um, tool handles, axe handles, all that kind of stuff. That's probably my favourite tree ash. It's a really wonderful tree. Um, where to buy a first aid kit? Well, I on, on the subject of first aid kits, I tend to find that most first aid kits that you buy off the shelf aren't particularly good I would say they aren't that suited to a lot of our outdoor uh, activities so I usually put my own first aid kit together but if you buy an off-the-shelf first aid kit just make sure um, if you want it for the outdoors just make sure it's got plenty of dressing bandages lots of tape all the things for small cuts and grazes and wounds that's the most common thing that I see um, that's the most common thing that I see uh, as a sort of first aid injury. Nothing too much more drastic than that, but make sure it's got plenty of that. And as I say, off the shelf ones are absolutely fine, but if you can do a little bit of research on what other things to carry in there, then that's that, then you'll be in really good shape. Somebody just put up a comment about plantain leaves and I missed it. And uh, somebody, I think it was something about using plantain, plantain leaves instead of dock leaves for nettle rash. Yeah, that's right. Um, Yes, yes, and, and you can. So the old adage is if you get nettle sting, I mean, I just picked up those nettles because I'm kind of used to it, but I would say if you're going to pick up nettles, probably use a glove if you're not used to it. And because uh, some people can have a bit of a reaction to nettle stings, but tends not to be that serious. Um, yeah, and so you use a dock leaf. If you get a nettle sting, you use a dock leaf to rub it onto the, the wound. And somebody's saying they're using plantain leaves instead, instead, and I totally agree with you because plantain leaves have a lot of what we call mucilage in them, which is a very slimy plant constituent, and it's very soothing. Anything with uh, mucilage in it is usually very soothing and uh, on the skin and also internally. So, um, But if you use plantain leaves instead of dock, then you're already on your way to becoming a bushcraft guru. So that's great. Birch polypora can be used as a field plaster. You're absolutely right. And uh, if... The polypore isn't too far from here. I could show you how you do that. Uh, okay, I've kind of lost the polypore. I found it, I don't know where it is. But yeah, you can use uh, polypore. You can um, cut a little section of the polypore and wrap it up like a plaster. That's very good knowledge. Where do you find plantain leaves? What do they look like? Uh, tricky one. Um, plantain's um, more elaborate common name is um, greater plantain or rat's tail plantain. There are quite a few kinds of plantain. But the one I think you're referring to is what they call rat's tail plantain. So what you want to look for, in the autumn time anyway, is a little flowering spike with lots of little seeds on it. And it looks like a rat's tail. That's a good key to the identification. Um, and the leaves are kind of uh, sort of 
The leaves are, it's hard to describe the shape of a plantain leaf, I suppose, if I'm not looking at one, but they're kind of fairly um, oval in shape. They're quite a wide, almost triangular shaped leaf. And the other name for plantain it is a very common plant. And if, if you're knocking around in the spring, you'll often find it. But the other name for plantain, greater plantain, is white man's footsteps. Um, because it's a plant which grows in places where it gets trampled on a lot and it gets stood on and it loves to grow on paths, not just at the side of paths, right on the middle where everybody stands on it. And the Native Americans actually called it white man's footsteps because um, it grew everywhere the white man meant because the, the theory behind that name is that the white man came and made lots of paths everywhere whereas the Native American um, wandered through the woods um, without using too many paths and was a bit more discreet about the way they travel. So that's where it got the name White Man's Footsteps. So it's another way to look for it is also just go to paths and you'll probably find it. Plantago Major is the name of that one. If you're into your botanical names, Preacher Bear. Um, okay, so any, if there are any other questions, I'll probably wrap this up at 36 minutes. I've done my half an hour. Um, we say we normally do half an hour, so I'll probably call it a day there. But thanks very much for um, joining me in the woods this morning. And there's lots of things I didn't get around to seeing and showing. Um, just because of the time, but uh, for the youth, thank you, Jane W, thank you, sorry, Jake W, thank you, you're welcome. It's fun just to get out into the woods and uh, have a look around and share a little bit of what you can find in a tiny little area, I haven't moved very far at all. Christina McFina, thanks, you're very welcome. Snappy Twigs Forest School, thanks, you're very welcome. While the last of the, um, quite last of the thanks, I suppose, are coming in, just spotted this on the ground. If anybody watched my nature walk from two weeks ago or last week, was it last week? No, the week before I think, I did a badger walk. And there we are, I'm gonna end on something lovely. That's a badger latrine, I've just spotted that. If you watch my badger walk, you'll know that badgers dig a hole before they scat into it. And I just spotted that. And there's a little hole with a little poo in it and it's full of earthworms and that's badger. So I just spotted that, thanks, this was fun. Well, thanks very much guys for joining me, appreciate that. And uh, have a good day and uh, you're very welcome. It's just great to be able to share a few things with you. So uh, take care, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.